So welcome everyone to this time series analysis workshop and thank you for joining today. We will soon start with the topic, so time series analysis, but first a few practical things. So we have time to answer your questions in the chat of this webinar. So if you have a question, type it in the chat and either you will have an answer directly or we will answer it during live during our questions and answer sessions in this webinar. If there is already a question that you also wanted to ask and it's asked by someone else, you can also upload it to make sure that we definitely answer this question. And remember this session will be recorded and it, we will provide you the YouTube link afterwards. But now, so on, at the bottom of your screen, you see this questions and answers icon. And if you click on it, this dialog opens where you can type your question in this field. And it will then appear here. Either you see the answer here in this same dialog or we answer it live. And you can see here this thumb up button and this is to upload questions. And now let's start this workshop time series about time series analysis. We will give it today here, Cory, a data scientist at NIME from the Austin office, then me, Marit, also a data scientist at NIME from the Constance office. And we say a big thank you to the materials that we showed today to Professor Daniele Tonini, who has helped us to put this time series workshop and time series course together that we provide next time in May. So this time series course goes deeper into the topics that we introduced today. Instead of 90 minute session like today, where we touch just a bit of each of these different characteristics of time series from concepts to forecasting and deployment, in the course we will have four 90 minutes sessions with exercises. And you can, the registration for the next course, next online course starting on May is already open and you can do it from our website. And today we will have the, these topics in our workshop. So we start with the basic concepts of time series. What makes a time series and how is it different from other types of data? Then we will look into some ways of doing descriptive analytics of our time series, both graphical and also numeric. Then we will move on to forecasting. So how do we predict the future of the time series, the future values using classical methods with a focus on ARIMA models that are specific to time series, but also using machine learning based models that you also know from other use cases probably. And at the end, we will have a look, how do we do the deployment? How do we apply the model that we have trained to generate future forecasts? So what is time series analysis? When we have time series data, it tells us something about conditions that change over time. For example, some economic conditions, the sales of a supermarket, the GDP of a country, but it can be anything. It can also be, for example, sensor data from a smartwatch, or it can be some sensor data from a machine to tell if the machine is working regularly or not. And now we have some dynamics of the objects that we observe, and we want to inspect there some behavior, regular and irregular, and we also want to predict what happens in the future. So we apply to this data where we have some time period and the behavior of an object in this time period. We apply some forecasting techniques so that we have an idea what happens in the future. Of course, it's impossible to say exactly what happens in the future. So our estimate given by the model, by the forecasting model, will always be imperfect but it's better than nothing. It's better than guessing what happens in the future. And when we have this information, the numeric estimate of the sales next week or something else, we can then take the right actions, support our business, have enough products in our warehouse or other types of actions. 
And often, like in my examples here, we associate time series analysis with financial, app <coughs> financial applications. But there are many different types of time series. It's not only about predicting sales, but we ha also have, for example, this sensor data. And also the financial applications, they can be measured for totally different objects, a whole country, a GDP of a country, or just a local supermarket, for example. And what is also different is that this time series is different in the dynamics and also in the frequency, how often we observe each pro, uh, object. The sales of a supermarket, we maybe have a value for each day. So the granularity is daily. If you are interested in the GDP of a country, daily data is not necessary. It's enough if you, if you have one value for each year. So the granularity is year, yearly. If you think th then think we have a smartwatch measuring a workout, then the granularity has to be much greater. It has to be something like seconds or milliseconds. Uh, no workout session will last year, uh, days or something like that. Here you see, so now you know there are different types of time series and these different types are used also in different industries. So this demand planning is a class classical example. We have the supermarket or someone sell selling a product and we want to predict how many products are sell sold in the future so that we have enough of them. We, have, we are prepared to the sales amount. But it could also be that we predict the number of shipped packages and react with the correct amount of workforce beforehand. This would be a logistics application. If we are planning an advertisement on some project, then we of course think probably the sales on this project increase and we can make sure we have enough supply of it in our warehouses. Also insurance, there we use time series models to predict or to make claim prediction. We predict how probably and when an accident is going to happen, what are the costs of this, and then we can adjust the insurances, uh, the policies that the insurance company provides. In the manufacturing, we could have the machine sending a sensor data, and we see their regular behavior, and then suddenly something irregular, probably the machine is broken, and we can stop the production line, for example. In today's webinar, we are going to handle energy consumption data as an example. And there we have data on the energy consumption of households and businesses. We see there are some patterns. There are peaks in energy consumption. And then there are times when the energy consumption is low. And now the company providing the energy can adjust to this information by better planning, for example, so that businesses adjust their processes according to the peaks and lows in the household energy consumption and also in the trading strategies of the energy companies. Here you already learned a few use cases of time series analysis. And you remember the data that we need for them, it's collected over time the same object observed at multiple time points, on many days, on many years, or in one minute, every second. For every second, we have the measurement. How is this then different from other type of data, from this cross-sectional data? So in this cross-sectional data, we have only a snapshot of the situation. So a measurement for one particular point of time. It could be, for example, the local supermarket and the customers there on one day. We could then say how many customers we had on this one day, what was the most popular product, what was the average basket size, and these kind of things. Or it could be the account balance of a company at the end of the year. And we could say, is it positive, is it negative? But what we cannot say is, for example, do we have more customers today than yesterday or the last week? Or is the most popular product now different, that it's sunny and warm as it was in February when it was cold? 
Also, we cannot say if our business is doing well in comparison to the last 10 years. For that, we would need several observations, so time series date. And here we observe then the same object, supermarket, company, any, any object of our interest over multiple time periods. So over multiple days, over multiple day, uh, years, whatever is the granularity required for our time series. And remember that when we have the time series and we want to analyze it, it needs to be equally spaced. So this means if we decide to have to collect the data at the daily granularity, then we need to have have it uh, systematically. So for the supermarket, we cannot say we collect on Monday, then on Thursday not, and then Wednesday again, and then we start collecting hourly on Thursday. We cannot also say for the company that we are interested first at the half year intervals. And after a few years, we start collecting only at years intervals. So it has to be equally spaced. What is the granularity depends on the use case. Already, the use case and the granularity, they can be different. But here you see a few examples of time series where you see other differences, how the time series can be different. Here you see the number of doctorates in the US in two different fields, in engineering and in education. And this, the granularity of this time series is yearly. And you see here two time series. Both are flat, relatively flat, but they have a different direction. The number of engineering doctorates goes up over the course of this time period, the number of education doctorates goes down. So this is already one information on our time series. What we don't see here though, some we don't see any fluctuations in any of these time series. Here, the situation is different. So here we have some climate data and it's reported at uh, monthly granularity. For every month, we have a value and what we see here, like in the previous time series, there is a direction. But what there is as well, there is some regular fluctuation. So now we see that the, actually the same patterns or the pattern from upward and downward movement repeats every 12 months. Again, we recognize something that we can use in modeling the time series, not only the direction, but the regular pattern, which is not the case here. Here we have the granularity daily. So for every day we have a record, which is in this case, the LinkedIn daily stock market closing price. Maybe you can see here a vague direction upwards, but the fluctuations are much more irregular. They have different scopes, like here, or magnitudes, like here and here. The fluctuation period can be short or long. So here is something much more irregular, which is also a part of time series. This is then a combination of the previous two. The granularity of this time series is minute. So for every minute, we have a value. And the value is how many photos were uploaded on the Instagram. And now that you see here, there are some regular peaks. So there seems to be a structure. There seems to be minutes and times of the day, of the day when people upload many photos on Instagram, sorry. And then there are more quiet times. But this regular pattern is not the only thing that we can observe in this time series. We also see some irregularities. Here happened something and people started to upload many photos on Instagram. What we don't see here is a direction. It, it seems to stay relatively flat over the time observed here. And here, one more example. Here we have data reported at the millisecond level. So the granularity is even greater than in the previous one. Here we have three different 
sensors, X, Y, and Z, coming from a workout session detected by your smartphone. And now the same, from the same activity, we can extract three different kinds of dynamics. So this bottom pan series shows a regular pattern, but the time interval within which it repeats, it's somewhat, it takes a bit more time than here in this time series generated by the sensor one. So there we also have a regular pattern, but it repeats more often than this given by the sensor X. What this sensor Z does, it produces something more irregular. So here we cannot really detect anything that is, that is regular. So what we finished now with these line plots was some kind of summary description. We had a look at the graphical properties of the time series. So how is the line plot when we show the values detected at every time point within the observation time range? We could say, is there a direction? Is there some kind of regular fluctuation? How much irregularity can we observe there in our time series? And we could do the same using numeric methods, as is, as is what we would do for any kind of data. For example, the averages and so on. And this helps us now to make an interpretation of the time series. So we can extract them seasonalities, or we can observe seasonalities which are the regular fluctuations, or we can observe a trend, so a direction in the time series and other things. And now that we have this information, we have now a better understanding of the phenomenon that we are modeling with the time series and maybe forecasting with the time series model. So in this forecasting phase, we already take use of these components, what we have extracted in this interpretation phase, and in addition, we also build a forecasting model to model what is left. So to model the irregularities and irregular part in our time series. And there we take use of the temporal structure in our data so that we assume that the previous values are informative about what happens next. What we can also do as part of time series analysis is hypothesis testing and simulation. For example, we could build an interactive dashboard with a line plot and there show different scenarios of how our time series is going to be in the future. When we build a forecasting model, you know, it will never be totally accurate about the future. It's just an estimate and what often happens our value or our forecast value is more or less outside the, or it deviates from the actual value. Using these numeric forecasting methods, so time series models, we get an estimate and we also get an, an accuracy metric for the model. So we have a scope where the, for the estimate and we can then say, is the true value within or without the scope. And uh, so we can also evaluate afterwards the practicability of our model. This is not the case when we make qualitative forecasts, like for example, sentences like this. This is either true or it's totally wrong, like it's in this case. And correcting these kind of sentences we don't have to do that if we use time series models with numeric predictions. But of course, we need both. So we need also a qualitative understanding of the phenomenon that we are modeling. Quantitative methods do better in forecasting the future, but we need the understanding not to end up with models like you see here. What we don't want to do is predict what happens in the future but we want to reduce the uncertainty of our predictions. We will soon come to doing these predictions, extracting these different parts of the time series, but before that, a short recap. So what is a time series? Time series is a collection of observations made at sequential points of time, in several days 
on several years, and so on. And these time series are characterized by either irregular or regular fluctuations, and also possibly a direction upwards or downwards. The period where these happen can vary. And when we then have the time series collected, we can then give an each observation an index depending on at which time point it was collected. Remember, these time points can be at any granularity. They can be minutes, they can be days, they can be whatever makes sense for you, our use case. But it has to stay the same. And when we then start modeling time series, we take use of this feature of time series, which we call autocorrelation, so that the observations from the various subsequent points of time, they are correlated. So probably, for example, the sales of yesterday or sales of last Saturday is informative of the sales on next Saturday, for example. To have a look at this time series for one specific use case, we use uh, energy consumption data. And this data comes originally from 6,000 households and businesses in Ireland, correct, uh, collected over one year by smart meters. And there we have for every hour a value, which is the total energy consumption. And if you think of 6,000 households and businesses during one year, there would, it might be difficult to find some regular behavior there. Households are very different compared to businesses in their uh, energy consumption, and also 6,000 is a huge amount. Therefore, what we have done, we have clustered the time series so that we have found households and businesses that are similar in terms of their energy consumption. This means from the one original time series, we now have constructed many time series, one for each cluster. And now these cluster time series are much more regular in their behavior, and it's also easier to model. Corey will soon start our examples using this data. But there's also already one example workflow using the same data and calculating KPIs of it and also doing some descriptive analytics. And you can access it on the NIME hub via this link. And in our workflows, we use components, time series components. And these are like nine nodes with different kinds of soft tasks, like for example, trading and ARIMA model. Components encapsulate the workflow and in the workflows inside many of these time series components, there is actually a Python script node. So what happens in the background is a Python script to make the analysis task. For you, it's enough to define all the settings in the graphical user interface of the component. And you can access these components on the example server and also via the NIME hub. And at this point, I will give over to Corey and come back at the later point is in this webinar. Okay, thank you, Mara. Let me bring up my screen here for a second. Okay, now we should be at the exact same spot. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about today is descriptive analytics. So we'll talk a little bit about loading, cleaning, um, and visually exploring your time series. Okay. So the first thing I wanna say is once you've got a series, um, we're gonna talk about some of the main elements of it. Uh, the first one being a trend. So in this example down here, you can see an example of a linear trend, that being this red line that pretty evenly fits through this time series. You can also have polynomial trends or even exponential trends. So these are just kind of the first level of pattern that we like to pull out of a time series. The second one I wanna talk about is cycle. Um, so there's two types of patterns we normally talk about, um, repeating patterns in a time series, um, one of them being cycle, one of them being a seasonality. So cycle is the more long term of the two, and it's less regular. 
So you can kind of see here that there's these cycles where we go up and down in the time series, but they're not always the same size. They don't always have the same magnitude. Um, they don't even always last the same amount of time, but we do have these different periods. So for example, here, um, we're going in an upward trend and here we're in a downward trend. Um, so that, that's the main thing about a cycle. Um, we see these um, with, uh, like with the climate, um, there's up cycles and down cycles in that. Um, and we see it in a lot of other data sets as well. But the ones that we're gonna be looking at today we're gonna see more of these seasonal patterns. So seasonal patterns are on shorter time spans, um, perhaps weekly patterns, and they're more regular. So these look a lot more similar than those um, cycles that we saw before. And that's not necessarily a hard rule. Um, these seasonalities may be um, more irregular or less regular depending on your data, um, but they're gonna be shorter and they're going to repeat with roughly the same um, magnitude. And then finally, after we've um, pulled out maybe our trend, maybe we've pulled out a cycle um, in some seasonal patterns, maybe even multiple of those, what we're left with um, we'll call the residual. And the goal is for that residual to just be white noise. So in classical forecasting, what we try to do is we try to pull out all of these patterns, we try to decompose our original um, time series and just be left with this randomness at the end. In that way, we've built a model that predicts um, our time series and we can use it for forecasting, um, just being left with this residual. And then some of the machine learning uh, methods that we use later on might be used to try to model this residual and pull out even more um, explanatory information. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about the frequency of a time series. So, Mart mentioned a few different times where you might have different granularities in your time series data. Maybe it's hourly data, maybe it's daily, weekly, or even yearly data. Um, and depending on what level of granularity you have with your data, you need to keep in mind um, which patterns you might expect to see. For example, our data from today's use case is energy consumption. So that's reasonably gonna vary with you know, the hour of the day, the day of the week, um, what time of year it is, maybe my air conditioning's on a lot in the summer, maybe my heat's on a lot in the winter, um, maybe I've got all my lights on at night, different things like that. So if I have hourly data, I need to be prepared to deal with daily seasonalities. If I have weekly data though, I don't need to worry about those daily patterns so much, and maybe I just need to look at annual patterns or maybe monthly patterns. Okay, so now to actually get into some of the descriptive graphical analysis, there's a few different graphs I wanna kind of walk through in this section, um, such as the time plot, the seasonal plot, um, and a few others that we'll get to here. And we'll talk about some numerical descriptive analysis as well. So the first plot I wanna show you is the time plot. So we all know this one, it's just the line plot, um, but there's some really important information that we can pull out of this. So you'll see two series here, the red one and the blue one, um, and they both have some trends, they move upwards, and they both have some seasonalities, right? They go up and down in this zigzag pattern. But we see over here that these zigzags tend to have about the same magnitude. So we call that an additive seasonality, and that's because while we have our trend, the actual value of that trend isn't affecting our seasonality's magnitude. So we're going up by about 10,000 on each of these spikes and then coming back down by that much. And as our trend line moves up, this average line, um, the magnitude of those seasonal patterns aren't changing so much. So we'll have a seasonality. And then on top of that, we've added a seasonality. I'm sorry, our trend and then adding the seasonality. Over here though, we see it behaving a little bit differently. When our time series has a low magnitude, these seasonal patterns are fairly small. And as we move up this line, those uh, seasonalities grow in magnitude in proportion to our actual passenger count here, this actual uh, magnitude of the series. So we call that a multiplicative seasonality. So perhaps it's going up by 10% and then going down by 10% and then up by 10% and then down by 10%. So those are multiplicative seasonalities. And you'll be able to notice those when they start um, growing in magnitude as the actual value of your series grows. 
And the reason why that's important is because we'll have to use different techniques to extract them from our series and go about properly decomposing um, that signal. Okay, so other things you can tell with a time plot, um, we can find gaps in our series. Um, maybe we're just working with a series that um, just is very irregular. We don't always have data. Maybe that doesn't mean it's missing, maybe it does, um, but it's a great way to identify those and start understanding where they are and how they behave so we can try to find solutions. So maybe that means um, imputing missing values. Maybe that means introducing an extra variable into our um, predictive model. That is how long we've had no data for, like how long has it been since the previous data point? Um, maybe our series is a turning point in it. Maybe that means we need one model for this section and one model for this section of our series. And maybe we have outliers. Time plots are also great ways to determine whether or not you see any outliers. Um, so here we've got one up here. Um, maybe that indicates uh, a special event. Maybe it's a holiday, for example, um, in our data. Um, and maybe we want to leave it, maybe we want to remove it, um, but we should never do that for no reason. So seeing this here, we should then know to go investigate further. Maybe I'll look at what day that is. Maybe I'll go ask around and see if anything special went on. Um, and we'd have different options for dealing with that. Okay, so time plots are great, but they don't always tell you useful information. So here we've got two different time plots, um, and I can kind of see that maybe there's a trend in this one. This one seems to definitely be going up and getting more irregular, um, but time plots aren't gonna answer everything. So the point here is that sometimes it's difficult to draw strong conclusions from a time plot, um, and sometimes it's easy depending on your trend and um, powerful, how powerful your seasonality is. One thing I see looking at this one is that we do have a um, increase in the magnitude of the variance as we move up here. So whatever kind of patterns are influencing this data set, it's probably multiplicative. Um, but again, these are examples of where you might not be able to pull tons of uh, insights from a line plot. So instead of a line, uh, a line plot or a time plot, uh, we can also use something called a seasonal plot. So what this looks like is several line plots, one for each season, um, stacked on top of each other. In this case, you see um, yearly data, and we can very clearly see a trend over the years here. They all have this um, pattern inside of the year where um, the value is higher in the summer, but as we go up in years, so we start down here with 49 and we move upwards to 1960. We can see that over the years, um, we also have a very clear pattern of growth. Another option for interpreting your data visually is the box plot. Um, so this one gives us very concise information about the different categories in our data, this being um, monthly information. We can see that in the summer, specifically um, July and August, we have very high uh, air travel rates. And down here in the winter, people are traveling less. It makes sense, they're probably taking vacations, um, but we can see it and we can give numerical values to that as well as we can see these averages and uh, um, outer limits here. Another option that we'll see in the example in a little bit is the autocorrelation function. So this is called an ACF plot for short. And what this does is it gives you a um, a line plot, basically, of the correlation values, the autocorrelation values of your time series. So, for example, if I look at um, zero here, that would be the correlation between t and t minus zero. So we see a one as everything correlates completely with itself. And then I start moving down here, and I see the correlation with t and t minus one, and as we go down. Negative correlations just meaning... Um, that it has a correlation, but to the negative value of that, that, that um, referencing example. And in this, we can see that there is some, or there's quite a bit of correlation between a value and the previous value, um, 0.95 in fact, which tells us that the time series doesn't change very quickly. Um, it shows us that we don't just have white noise. Um, and we also see that the correlation function um, spikes again here at 24 and again down here at 48. So that implies that we might have some 24-hour seasonal patterns here. 
because our value correlates to um, the value 24 hours back just about as strongly as it correlates to the value four or three hours back. What is this one? Two hours back. So we actually see um, some really useful information here. And this one's actually going to be very useful when we get to the ARIMA section later, because it will help us determine whether or not our series is um, stationary. And we'll, we'll get to what that means a bit later. Another related plot is called the partial autocorrelation. So this is what you'll, it'll look like down here usually. Um, and this is a lot like the ACF plot um, with one major difference. While it still shows the correlations between values and lagged versions of themselves. So we still see it starting up here at one because of course T and T minus zero being the same value will correlate completely. But what it does here is it removes the correlations that are due to um, repetition. Uh, for example, if T and T minus one are correlated, then of course T minus one and T minus two are correlated, then that means that T1 and T2 are correlated by default. Um, so that kind of chaining effect. And what the partial autocorrelation um, does is it goes through and it removes those kinds of uh, um, relationships. And then all we see is how much correlation is exclusively for T and T minus 10, T minus 12, so on and so forth. Okay, so now I'm gonna jump into a demo um, where I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the ways we can analyze um, this data visually, um, specifically in nine. One second while I do that. Okay. So here you see a nine workflow. Um, everything here is already built and run. We've got our file reader at the start where we read in this table. So I'll show you what that looks like um, for starts. So we've got all of these different clusters that Mara introduced um, at the beginning of the webinar. Um, so these are different sections of our um, energy consumption data. So they were, there were some explanatory statistics generated on all of the uh, original series from every meter. And then they were clustered based on based on those explanatory statistics and combined into one um, series for each of those clusters to give us some more um, regular data. Okay, so we've got a timestamp and we've got energy consumption by the hour. Okay, so we go through here, I filtered it down just to make it a little bit easier to look at. So now we've just got that timestamp and one cluster. In this case, we're using the cluster 28. And then this will introduce the first component. So this component, I'll show you what it looks like on the inside as well. So components, if I open them, they're just more NIME nodes inside. So this is a really easy way to take um, a whole bunch of NIME nodes and then build your own um, component that basically functions like a NIME node in itself. Um, and this is a great way to uh, take processes that you use regularly and just kind of save them and encapsulate them for repeated use or for sharing. So this one in particular, um, it's called timestamp alignment. And what it does is we select a um, timestamp column. So in that case, that was our column called row ID. And we select a period. So our data should be hourly. So what that will do is it'll run through this data and it'll say, okay, is there an hour gap between this value and the previous value? And if there's not, it'll let me know by introducing a missing value into that column. And that way I don't have an irregularly um, spaced time series. So now that I know there's a missing value here, I can go through and do something about it. So in this case, the number of missing values is fairly small. So I'm comfortable going through and um, imputing this data. If I had many missing values in a row here, um, maybe I would need to try to pursue a different solution or be more critical about just going in and imputing that data. So now that I understand that there are missing values um, because there were missing records, I can actually go through and use the missing value nine node to correct for those. So I'm going to use um, a linear interpolation method. 
you can see there's quite a few other options in NIME for imputing those missing values. I'm, I'm going to choose to use linear interpolation though. Okay. Now you can see that my missing values have been filled in and I no longer have the missing timestamps in my data. So that's going to allow us to use some of the classical techniques in a bit. Another component that I want to introduce here is called aggregation granularity. So what this component does is it makes it very easy to aggregate your time series data to a um, specific timestamp. So maybe I want to take my hourly data and I want to aggregate it to weekly data. I could select um, week here and then at the output, everything would be aggregated either with the sum, max, min, mode, um, whatever you choose down here. Okay. And then we have a line plot node that we can use to view our aggregated series. So the first thing I see when I look at this is that we've definitely got a um, seasonality here. I don't see a super strong trend, but maybe if I tried to draw one, there'd be a downward one, or that might just be based on the sample of data that I'm looking at. Um, but I definitely see a seasonal pattern here. Um, we can't really tell if it's additive or multiplicative because we don't have a strong trend. So that's just something to keep in mind. And we see actually two patterns. Um, so of course we have these very obvious spikes here. So those are our daily patterns. And we have these um, bigger ups and downs as we see these couple of values that are low. Um, and that's our weekly patterns. So when we go forward and we start trying to analyze more of our data numerically and with um, mathematical techniques, um, we'll want to try to make sure that we see something that looks like a weekly pattern and a daily pattern, because we've seen it in the line plot. Okay. So the next component that I'm going to introduce is one called inspect seasonality. So this is the component that you'll use to generate um, the ACF as well as the PACF plot. So here's the ACF plot for our time series. Um, we can see these spikes here at 24, 48, um, so on and so forth. If you look really closely, you might even notice that there's kind of a sweeping pattern here. And if I look at what that first value is, it's right around here at a 180-ish, 160-something. And I think that's the number of hours in a week. So again, a little bit more confirmation that I should expect to find a daily for these peaks and a weekly for these peaks seasonality. Down here, we have the uh, PACF plot as well. Um, if I look here at the 24 hour mark, I do see another spike. And down here at the 168, I see another spike, but it's a bit smaller. So another um, spot where you might be able to see that. Okay. And then another component called decompose signal. So this one's actually going to use the inspect seasonality component inside of it. Um, so that's something you can do if you need to. You can nest components. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to use that inspect seasonality in another component called remove seasonality um, to try to go through and actually um, turn our time series into something that just looks like noise. So here's our original signal and the ACF plot of that original signal. Um, we've attempted to fit a polynomial trend to it, um, which doesn't look like it's changed it too much, although we can see it's shifted it down to uh, zero line. So ACF plot still looks largely the same. And then we're going to try to remove two sets of seasonal patterns. So here we have one removed, so we can see that it looks very different now. But I still see these spikes that seem to be roughly a week apart. And I can still see those spikes in my ACF plot here as well. So we go through and move that, remove that again. And now I see mostly noise with a couple spikes here and here. So I might look into what those represent. Um, but for now, they're going to stay in our pattern. They might be holidays. Um, they might be um, some other kind of special event. So this might be something that we don't know from our time series data as it stands. And I can see that whatever they are, they're, they're not regular. So they could just be random outliers as well. Um, because you see that they're not equally spaced. And we see a ACF plot that goes down to zero and for the most part stays there. So that's, that's an indicator that we can use the ARIMA model a little bit later. 
Okay. A few other plots here. We can use a, um, a line plot node. So this one using um, Plotly to generate seasonal patterns. So you can see this one isn't quite as clean as the one you saw in the slides. Um, so this is expected, but we do see that um, regardless of the day of the week, um, or regardless of the um, actual value here, we see a clear pattern um, where the days in the middle of the week are higher than the ones at the end. So Sunday is pretty much across all of our time series, the lowest um, values for energy consumption where our weekdays are higher. So maybe we're looking at an office space here um, or somebody that uses a lot of energy during the weekday. Another option was the uh, conditional box plot. So this is where you can define a condition um, for in for each condition, you'll have a separate box plot. Um, in our example here, that's hour of the day. Um, so these are box plots representing all of the data we have, for example, um, at noon. And we can see that in the middle of the day, we have significantly higher um, average energy consumption than we do uh, in the middle of the night, which is expected. But this also gives us another way to see that, um, that, that seasonal pattern, in this case, the daily pattern. We could also do this based on day of the week and hopefully try to see a weekly pattern. And then finally, um, here's another line plot where we can establish um, confidence bounds um, for our series. Um, and this is on hour of the day again. And, and that's based on the variance of those values inside of the hour. So there's a lot of different options that we can use. Uh, we see that there's most variance here during the day. And this is another way for us to visually explore our data. Okay. So with a little bit of those demoed in NIME, I'm going to um, jump back to the slides here so we can keep moving. Okay. Are there any questions on what you've seen there? Try to Oops. Go back here for a second. So there's a couple of questions about uh, this workflow in the hub. Um, we still need to determine if we can upload this to the hub, but we will be uh, finding that out and we'll let you know shortly afterwards. Okay, so the rest of these seem to be questions um, slightly unrelated to the uh, workflow example. So I'll let those hang out in chat for now and I'll get back to the slides. Okay, so the next section we're gonna talk about is quantitative forecasting. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about numbers now. Um, so there's a few different main groups that I'm gonna kind of slap some of these forecasting methods into. Um, some classical time series analysis, which is the kind of decomposition of our series into things like trend and seasonality, um, and kind of just looking at that uh, correlation, that autocorrelation um, in the data afterwards. So that's a lot of what we just saw there. We extracted um, trends, we extracted seasonal patterns, um, and we just kind of replicate those into the future and try to do forecasting. And that's a very classical approach. Um, and there's different methods that kind of use those techniques. Um, one good example being the ARIMA model. Um, then there's some explanatory models that try to just build um, on past observations, just looking at relations with uh, different predictors. So think kind of things like regressions here. And then we've got machine learning models, um, which we can kind of twist into being forecasters. So things like um, regression trees, um, things like uh, neural networks and different numeric predictors. So the first one on that list is a uh, classical time series analysis. So the decomposition being the most uh, straightforward of those. So that was when we just extracted a trend line there. So um, that was 
probably basically what we did in that decompose signal component. Um, so we got the trend, we got a couple of seasonal patterns, and we can use those and extrapolate them into the future uh, to get a forecast. Another option that um, wouldn't work super well with our data um, is exponential smoothing. Uh, so this is something that we might try to apply to those residuals after we've extracted those different components in that decomposition section. Um, exponential smoothing is basically a weighted average of past observations. So if I look at the past five values, for example, in the series, uh, maybe I take the average of them, um, but maybe I don't just take the regular average, maybe I'll weight them. And the more recent terms, I'll weight more heavily. Um, and in that way, I'm doing exponential smoothing. And then there's the ARIMA model. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about this one until we get to its slides, um, but it kind of combines a lot of other things we're familiar with. It's an autoregressive auto integrated moving average is um, what the ARIMA stands for. And that's basically gonna be a regression model built on some features of your time series. Okay. So it, the first thing we wanna do once we get to this section is really kind of pick what type of model we wanna try. Um, and a lot of the time that means trying multiple types of models and seeing which one gives us our desired results. Um, but things to keep in mind are things like your forecast horizon, um, that being how far into the future we need to forecast. Um, for example, if I have all of my data on energy consumption up to right now, um, and I just need to predict how much energy I'll use in the next one hour, um, then the naive method usually works very well for that. Um, and what I do for that is just say, okay, how much energy did I use last hour and use that as my prediction for the next hour. However, if I was trying to predict how much energy I was gonna use next week, um, methods like the naive um, prediction become significantly less um, useful. Another option might be the type um, of data or how much of it's available. Uh, for example, if I don't have tons of data, I really don't wanna use a neural network. Um, maybe I want to stick to something like a regression line. Um, maybe I need something that's highly accurate. Maybe I don't need something that's highly accurate. Maybe I just need something that uh, gives me a rough prediction, but with a confidence interval. Um, so I can just tell if I'm trending up or down. So those are just different things to consider. How readable do the results need to be? Do I need something that gives me um, feature importance? Um, for example, a regression, you get uh, values for the coefficients. Whereas if you were using a, a neural network, you don't really get any information on those uh, features as you're largely using um, a black box. How many series are there to forecast? Uh, how, what does my deployment framework look like? How much time do I have? And different things like that. So you've got a lot of options to consider here when choosing a model. Um, so these are just things to keep in mind. I think the most important ones to remember um, are the forecast horizon, how much data you've got, and um, really what your end goal is. Do you need specific forecasts or do you need more of a explanatory model? Okay. Now, before we actually start modeling, um, the first thing we should do, and this is true for basically all modeling, um, is we need to partition our data. So the reason why we do that is so that we have the opportunity to actually test our model um, and try to get an understanding of how it will perform in a deployment environment. Um, with that being said, it's very important that when we do our partitioning into our training and testing sets, that we make that look as much like a real deployment scenario as possible. So with time series data and time series forecasting, that means we need to make sure that our training data is from the past and our testing data is from what it would be in the fact of the future, right? So we don't want our model trained on future data because that doesn't model um, what a real deployment framework might look like. So the way we do that in NIME is we'll just make sure that our data set is sorted before we get to this stage. And then we'll use the take from top approach. So what this will do is just take the top 80% um, in this example of our data table and say, okay, that's your first partition. The rest of it goes to the second one. So in that way, we're using the first 80% of our records as a training set and the last 20% as a testing set. And it's very important that we do it that way, again, so that our um, training and testing sets, model what they would really look like in a real world deployment situation. That way that our testing is as accurate as possible. 
Now there's a couple different ways that we test and score uh, forecasting models. Um, two of which here are out sample and in sample. So we put these little graphics up here, not because you necessarily want to do it this way in a nine workflow, um, but to kind of make it clear what the difference is. So here we have that first 80% of our data set and it's being used to train this random forest regression. Um, and then we're deploying it onto our predictor and generating some scores. So in this example, you see that we're actually deploying that predictor onto the other part of our data. This is actually our test set, something the model wasn't shown during training. So that's called out sample. Over here, we're deploying that model and scoring it on the same data that we used for training, and that's called in sample. So a lot of the times you'll see that um, just as an output of the, the learner. So in this case, if you just went to the um, regression learner here, this light blue box, and you looked at some of its outputs, you'd see stuff um, like it's R squared value, it's RMSE, different scores actually output from this component. So you wouldn't have to do it this way, um, but just keep in mind that out sample and in sample are very different. Um, so a lot of the times you might see really nice scores on in sample scoring, or we might not see such great scores on out sample. Um, and that might imply overfitting, um, that might imply um, that our model decays quite rapidly, um, and that our forecast horizon is quite low. Um, there's different things to keep in mind there. The other important term, so we have out sample static and in sample static up here. The other important term is dynamic. You see, basically you have out versus in sample, and you have static versus dynamic. Um, Static means that when we deploy this model, so for example, if it's a regression model that uses the past two lagged values of the, um, the data, then we're always using true values, values that we've actually recorded in a static test. Dynamic means that we predict the next value, we predict the next value, and then we actually use those past two, those prediction values now as inputs to our regression. So if it's dynamic, we're using forecasts as new inputs, and if it's static, we're using true values that we have to have from somewhere. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, you'll see a very high accuracy um, for static forecasting, um, where you probably won't for dynamic forecasting. And that's gonna come um, into effect when you start talking about your forecast horizon. Um, for example, we see the naive method work very well with static forecasting. If we can always just look at the true past value, um, then we have a really good predictor with the naive method. But once we have to start using um, dynamic forecasts to get farther out from our actual recorded data, the naive method doesn't work as well because now it just starts saying, okay, that, that value of energy that I used last hour, that's the same value of energy I'm gonna use every hour forever. Um, and that's of course not going to be true. So keep in mind what type of test you're running on your forecast. Um, the one that's going to model your real world um, deployment scenario the most is most likely going to be out sample um, dynamic, depending on what your forecast horizon looks like. But if you're trying to do something like missing value imputation, maybe you're trying to uh, build a forecast to fill in the gaps in your old series, then maybe that is in sample static that you're gonna be deploying into. So just, just keep that in mind again. Um, make sure whatever test we use is the one that's going to um, look the most like your real world use case. Okay, another thing to keep in mind, and we kind of saw this a bit earlier when I first showed the decomposed signal. Um, we broke it down in that last picture of the signal, the last uh, time plot of the series, uh, we had a couple of random spikes. Um, and if we dug into those, we may have found that they were holidays or um, something like that. So it's just something to keep really keep in mind. Um, so in this graphic down here, uh, we have a time plot of uh, breakups according to Facebook statuses. Um, so we see that different times of year, there are different spikes. For Christmas, for example, that goes way down. Um, it's really high right before the winter holidays. Um, so these are just things to keep in mind. Maybe these are extra features we can add um, into our regression model. Um, they're just things we won't be able to extract purely from uh, timestamp and output number. Okay, so now I wanna introduce the ARIMA model. So the ARIMA model 
uh, I like to introduce it at first basically as a regression. Um, so it's a little bit different than regressions, but the way that it's different is in um, the actual terms that it regresses on top of. So there's a couple important prerequisites for using the ARIMA. Um, the first one being that your series is um, stationary. So what a stationary time series means is that all of its statistics stay the same as you move across the time series. So that move across it meaning um, as you move across the time dimension. So that means that the mean value needs to stay the same, so it needs to look relatively flat. Um, the variance needs to stay the same, so it can't be um, you know, really low variance on this side, and then all of a sudden it starts spiking a lot, and we have a high variance series um, into the future. Uh, we need to make sure that we deal with that in some fashion before we can apply the ARIMA model. Okay. So when we talk about the ARIMA model, um, usually it'll look a bit like this. So we talk about an ARIMA, we say it's got a P, a D, Q. Um, and sometimes we'll have a capital versions of those same, um, same letters. So these just reference the different, uh, I don't know if I want to call them hyperparameters, but we'll call them that for now, of the ARIMA model. Um, so there's a few different terms in the ARIMA. Um, so the, the P represents the number of autoregressive terms we use in the regression, that meaning how many past lagged values do we use? Uh, for example, if I say I'm doing an ARIMA with P equals five, then I'll use T minus one, T minus two, up to five um, as inputs for my regression. D is the number of times we've applied seasonal differencing um, or non-seasonal differences. So what this means is we take T and we subtract T minus one and we keep doing that. Um, and the reason we do that is because we need to generate a series that is stationary. So say we've got a, um, a time series and it's basically the line like y equals x. It's just a linearly increasing um, line and it's just straightforward that. If I apply um, differencing and I just take t and I subtract t minus one and I just do that um, for every value in my series, then what I'll end up with is a flat line. And I can always go back and add those by um, taking those values and re-adding them um, back to my series later. But what I've done is I've created the series that is now stationary by applying that differencing, um, and now it meets the prerequisites of the ARIMA model. Finally, there's Q, um, which also is going to be a number of terms in my regression model. Uh, this one represents past forecast errors. Um, so that's that epsilon that you'll see in some of the regression formulas. And that's how many of those we lag and add to our model. Finally, you'll see these capital versions of those same letters. And those just represent seasonal versions. So let's say, and this S down here at the end is going to be the seasonal period. So let's say my S is 24. And I'm talking about hourly data. So that means I'm talking about a 24-hour seasonality here. So if I say my capital P is five, like I did with my lowercase p, um, then I look at the value 24 hours back, 48 hours back, et cetera, et cetera, until I have um, five seasonal patterns back uh, of lagged values. The D again represents the differencing, except now it's not just the regular differencing, it's the seasonal differencing. Um, so this is something that we've applied in that decompose signal component. Um, seasonal differencing being, I'll take, T and I'll subtract T minus 24 to try to erase those daily patterns and get a series that is stationary. Q, again, it's just like the other Q, except we'll look at the uh, forecast errors from 24, 48, et cetera, into the past. Okay, so that's what all of these coefficients mean when we're looking at an HREMA model. So now we'll look at them in a little bit more detail. Uh, so here's the first part of the ARIMA, the autoregressive part. So this is the AR. And this is the part that's determined by that P. So we just built, we take a typical regression model. Um, we've got our uh, coefficients here and we've got some constant value, but the terms that we're regressing against are just the lagged copies of our output. So we're trying to predict Y of T. So that's just the value. And we're trying to predict that by using the past lagged values t minus one, t minus two, up to t minus p, whatever we decided to set that as when we um, 
set up our ARIMA model. And then we have this epsilon t at the end. Um, and based on the assumptions for the ARIMA model, that needs to be um, white noise. So that needs to be randomness. Um, so that's, that's where the requirement for our stationary data set comes in. OK, so that part, just a regression on top of the lagged values. So that's the AR. OK, so here's a couple of examples of series that might fit into different frameworks. So if I look at this one, um, it looks kind of like a random walk. Um, so I see that I've got a um, AR1 process. So that means that I'm only using the past one value to generate a prediction for this one. So I just look at the past one and I say, okay, uh, that's the only important predictor. And that's gonna happen whenever you see um, a random walk. If you have um, no values, then it's just white noise. So this is a 0.5 on my AR1. So that means that my regression equation would just be Y of T equals um, some constant value plus 0.5 times the past value uh, plus some error metric. So this one is kind of right in between um, white noise and the random walk. Okay, so here's one that uses uh, AR2. So that means that it uses, we would find um, use in the past two values. Uh, and we can kind of see that as it looks a little bit less noisy, um, it seems to be following some slightly more long-term patterns. Uh, the past two values are useful here uh, with the decaying actual um, correlation here. So these are just some graphs to uh, give you an idea of what you might expect to see and um, when you might expect to use different levels of that p-value to determine how far back you want to go. Okay. The other half of that regression model is going to be the moving average part. So again, this is just um, some more terms we're basically adding to this big old uh, regression equation that is the ARIMA model, um, but they're not normal regressors. Um, so these are past forecast errors. So when we generated um, yt minus one, when we built that prediction, we actually ended up with a um, epsilon t minus one, the forecast error from the past prediction. So we don't always have to know these either. Um, these can be approximate values, um, and usually they are in fact. So keep in mind that we don't actually know what these values are. We're gonna be approximating them most of the time. Okay, and beyond that, um, again, we're just looking at building this regression, um, finding our coefficients, and that'll ultimately be combined with the equation we saw back here. So we'll have both of those parts together. Okay. And here's another example of what some series might look like if they are um, MA1 or MA2. So again, we can kind of see here that it holds fairly steady. Um, it looks kind of like a random walk based on the previous value, or this one shows slightly more long-term patterns. Um, but the real point here, I just want to point out, is that it's not always easy to tell um, what is an AR process and what is an MA process. Um, so there's some other techniques that we want to use there, such as um, analyzing our ACF and PACF plots. Okay, so once we get everything combined, uh, we end up with this big equation um, for the autoregressive component and the moving average component. This having our lag values up to P and this having our forecast errors up to Q. So it's important to remember, again, that your, um, your time series needs to be stationary uh, for this type of modeling to work because what it's aiming to do is just take that white noise, that extra residual at the end of our series and extract any remaining information out of it. And then you'll remember that there was the I as well. So that was just the number of times we differenced to create a stationary series that we could use um, this model on. So if I didn't do any differencing um, in my ARIMA model, that I would just call this an ARMA um, because I didn't use the I part. Um, if I did use some differencing in the ARIMA model itself, um, then it would be the full ARIMA. So if I um, use, for example, 
that decompose signal component that we saw in the demo. Um, and I extract uh, these seasonal patterns. I do all my differencing ahead of time. And then I don't need to do any differencing um, afterwards. So I would have an I value um, or a D value of zero representing no, um, no I at all. So the ARIMA can do basic differencing on its own as well. Okay. So here's now some more examples of processes that might um, have different values here. So what I really want to draw your attention to is mostly this line here. Um, so this is an ARMA 2-1. So that means P and Q are 2 and 1 respectively, um, which is the same thing as saying it's an ARIMA Q01. So if, if one or more of the terms in the ARIMA model are 0, we'll usually just drop that, um, that term from the name. For example, if we used an ARIMA with a, a p value of two, um, a d value of zero, and a q value of zero, we could just call it an AR2. So keep that in mind. If you see something like ARIMA, this means, or sorry, if you see something like ARMA, no I, um, this just means that there was no differencing applied to the series before the ARIMA model was applied. Um, if you see something that's just an R2, that means we didn't use any of those forecast errors as um, regressors. And then, of course, if you see the full ARIMA with numbers like this, then we are applying each of those features. OK. So we touched on this really briefly a little while ago. Um, but there are also those seasonal uh, additions that you can add to the ARIMA model. Um, so those being um, lags that go back in increments of 24 if we have a 24-hour seasonality, um, differencing applied 24 values apart in the series, or um, forecast errors from 24 um, units into the past. So there's different ways that we can um, score um, ARIMA models or regression models in general. Um, normally, uh, we'll estimate our parameters with the maximum likelihood method. Um, there's a few other options there, but that'll be the most common one that we'll use. That'll be the default setting in the components that we're going to show you in nine here in a minute. Um, and we can, uh, a common score for the ARIMA model, a common metric used for scoring it is something called the AIC, um, the IKK information criterion, which I always mispronounce. Um, and that equation is basically this. So it's negative 2 log of the likelihood um, plus 2 times p, where p is the number of parameters in the model. So what this is doing is it's basically punishing us for having more complicated models. So it kind of takes into account the complexity there. Uh, because in general, we want to have simpler regression um, equations uh, so that our model will generalize better. If we don't see any actual improvement in the forecasting, why would we add more coefficients is the idea here. So we'll use this to compare different ARIMA models. OK, so just to kind of walk through that, um, what our steps are to apply um, these ARIMA modeling techniques. The first thing we need to do is take our series and to look at it, we need to understand it visually, apply some actual numeric um, tests to it as well, make sure that our series is stationary. Um, and then we can look at the ACF and PACF plot, uh, which we didn't really go into too much today for how to use those plots to determine good values for PD and Q. Um, but that is something we touch a bit more on in the full course. Once we have those, we'll try um, to build some different ARIMA models. It's usually a good idea. If you think, for example, that a 305 um, ARIMA is a good combination um, to try, maybe try things like 204 and just try different directions there to try to test some of the um, nearby values and see how they do. And then we'll look at all of those um, scores. Maybe we'll look at the AIC. Maybe we'll look at um, some of the other uh, scores that we also see um, at the output there. And we'll try to decide which model works best for us. And we'll analyze those residuals. OK, so after that, I'm going to open up a demo now. Um, quickly show you how some of these ARIMA components are going to work in NIME. And then we'll move on to some machine learning. <laughs> 
share first. That would be good. Okay. So here we see, oops, yep, here we see the um, workflow for training our ARIMA model. So this stuff at the beginning, um, we saw the decomposed um, signal component in my previous demo. We took that original signal, we extracted the trend, we pulled out two sets of uh, seasonalities, the daily pattern and then the weekly pattern. And we're left with what looks like mostly noise. And our ACF plot here um, is probably as good as we're going to get with this seasonal removal. So maybe we need to look at which days these represent. Um, why are we seeing spikes in um, our data here? Perhaps they're outliers. Perhaps we can remove them. Um, but that's a venue that we still need to explore. OK. So we partitioned our data, making sure to take it from the top down. That way we have past data for training and future data for testing. We use this ARIMA learner component. Inside of it, we'll be able to select different orders for P, D, and Q. Um, you can select which type of um, estimation method you want to use. And you'll select the target column. So in this case, we're going to try to apply our ARIMA learner to the residual that was output from that decomposed signal. So this was our original signal, the trend that was removed, those two seasonal components, and then the residual. Okay. So again, in this case, I'm training a very basic ARIMA model with an AR1, um, zero for I um, and zero for Q. So you commonly hear this one is called as an AR1. So just using the one prior value to try to predict um, the next one. And we see a couple outputs here. This top one, if you're familiar with NIME, um, it's basically going to be like most of the learner predictors in NIME. You'll have one for training a model, one for deploying a model, and they'll be connected by these boxes um, that have the information about the trained model. So this is just going to be the ARIMA model output. The second output of this component here is the model summary. It gives us some information um, about that trained model. Um, so here's some, for example, in sample um, scoring. We have our ARC, our AIC, and our BIC. Um, and we actually have the um, value for our first term here, the coefficient being 0.79, and this being the standard error on that coefficient. So that means that our RIMA model then is a um, 0.79 times the previous value. It's a very simple regression in that one. And there's another component here. So we have the predictor, but we also have something else called analyze ARIMA residuals. So this will give you a way to kind of go through and more robustly look at what's happening with the residuals at the, um, after the prediction in our um, ARIMA model. So these are the values. So basically, the forecast errors. So here's the uh, ACF plot of our um, residuals. So for the most part, they stay inside of this confidence bound. We want to see um, no correlation between our residuals. We want to see them just being normally distributed white noise. Remember that that was one of the assumptions of uh, the ARIMA model is that this error term should be noise. Um, and that comes from the stationarity that we've induced earlier. But we see that at one point, it breaks out of this confidence interval by quite a bit. Um, and it's actually lagged way down here. Um, on the 24 hour mark. So maybe that means that when we corrected um, our 24 hour seasonal differencing, which we did by lagging, um, maybe we did that too much. Maybe we need to go back and find a different way to handle that. Um, but that's what we see here is that there's still some strong correlation at the 24 hour mark um, and we need to do something about that. So down here, uh, we have the LB test for stationarity. Um, so this is gonna look at uh, the different lag values, in this case, the previous, the first 10, and either accept or reject um, based on that test. Um, so we see here that the first one says not rejected. Um, so in this case, don't pay too much mind to that. Um, that's kind of just a uh, feature, I don't want to call it a feature, of the LB test here. But what we do see is then moving onwards, um, two through 10 all reject the stationality assumption. So we see that and 
kind of visible up here as we move through those lags as well. Um, so this is a good way to test and see if we did effectively meet the required assumptions to use the ARIMA model. And then we have just a straight up time plot of our residuals down here. So we can get an idea of how they're behaving, see if we see any strong patterns um, and so on. And then finally, we have a normality um, histogram down here of the um, residuals. We have some information about the variance, the mean, um, and a few other statistics. So in this case, I see that we've rejected um, the stationarity assumption, and I see a very strong spike in the autocorrelation plot at 24. So maybe that's something I'd go back and revisit. Okay, so let's assume for a second though that we are happy um, with our ARIMA model. How do I go about deploying that? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, we'll just connect our ARIMA learner to our ARIMA predictor. When we open up the configuration dialog for that predictor, um, we'll be able to select how far into the future we want to forecast and a few other um, options here. So in this case, our future forecasts are going to be um, dynamic. Um, and this isn't going to affect the um, actual forecasting. Uh, there's two outputs from this predictor, one of them being um, our forecasts and one of them being in-sample predictions. So we can use, so this box will determine whether or not the in-sample predictions at the second output um, are dynamic or if they're static. Dynamic again, meaning that we start creating predictions, but we use those um, forecasts as new inputs to our um, model. And if I leave this unchecked, then it's static and we're using the true values wherever we can. Down here, we have linear and levels. So that's going to determine whether or not we undo the um, differencing that we uh, introduced with the I part of the ARIMA, that D value. So in our case, we didn't actually um, do any differencing, so these won't have any effect here either. Okay. So then when I execute that, I can look at either the forecast or the ensemble predictions. In this case, I'm gonna look at my forecast. So what I have here is 168 rows of forecasted values. So we show the prediction. So it's saying it'll probably be about 0.5, um, and it says that with this standard error. And we can see that that eventually just decays down to zero. So if you remember from when we looked at our model summary, when we looked at that AR1 term, it was 0.79 times the previous value. That was the only regression term. So we have Y of T equals Y of T minus one times 0.79. Uh, if we keep doing that over and over again, um, we expect to see that decay to zero. So this might be an example of a model that works okay um, if our forecast horizon is one hour into the future. Um, but as we can see here with this forecast, um, if we're going out more than a day or so, then all we're going to get is zeros. So things to keep in mind. And then finally, we combine this with our actual future data, um, and we'll put it through a numeric score and see how it did. So this is our out sample test, out sample dynamic. So we can get an R squared value, quite poor. We have a pretty high uh, mean absolute error, especially considering that the magnitude of these values weren't very high because these were just the residuals from our series. Um, so these aren't, aren't looking very good, right? I mean, the absolute percentage error is nearly one. Um, so this Aruba model did not perform well. So that could be because um, a 100 Arima was no good for our data. Um, that could be because our residual was just entirely noise. Maybe we already extracted everything there is to know um, with this decomposed signal. Um, or maybe it has something to do with the, uh, the rejection of the um, stationarity assumption from our ARIMA model. Maybe we need to go back and fix this lag. Um, so there's different things that might affect that. Uh, but in general, don't expect super high accuracy scores. Um, in a test like this, because remember that we've already pulled out a lot of information on this series. We've already pulled out a trend in two sets of seasonal patterns, and now we're just trying to grab whatever we can out of that remaining um, residual, that remaining noise. So in general, we won't be seeing super high accuracies. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up the Q&A here, see if there's anything 
related to this, um, this workflow first. So, I think I can maybe take over with the machine learning. We have a couple of questions. Yes. So far, we have managed quite nicely to write the answers to them. And I will share my screen, just a second. So we'll now touch a bit about also about machine learning models to generate forecasts of time series. And so far, Corey introduced you these classical methods, which are the ARIMA models, and they all use the temporal structure in the data. So that we now, the previous values are informative about the next values. And we now bring this idea to training a machine learning model, which actually don't expect that by default. Sorry. Um, so we have now, for example, a linear regression model. And if you were now predicting, for example, the sales of some product, ice cream or sparkling water tomorrow, we could use as predictor, for example, the temperature. So there would be no temporal structure between the predictor and between the target column. But we don't do this. Instead, we use the lagged values as predictors. So the sales of ice cream or sparkling water yesterday, the day before, are up to the previous, previous weekday previous same weekday in the past. And how we generate these columns, we use the lag, these predictor columns, we use the lag column node. We generate as many, a vector of past samples containing as many columns as we are interested in the values in the past. And we can also define the interval. So do we jump over some past values? For example, if we were only interested in the past value on exactly the same weekday and we had daily data, we, could, it would, we would then increase this to seven. And as Corey explained, remember when do you do partitioning for time series, make data, take data from top, not to predict past values on a model trained on future values. And here is a configuration of the lag column node. You remember as many columns are generated as you have are interested in lagged values and you consider rows above as defined by the interval written here. You saw an example of a linear regression model, but you could also use any of the other regression models provided as nine native nodes or by the nodes coming with integrations, like for example, this deep learning integration or the h 2 machine learning integration. The configuration is often quite similar. So what you do, you define as the target column, the current value, for example, the energy consumption today or in this particular hour. And as predictors, you use the lagged values. So the energy consumption, for example, in the previous 10 hours or in the previous 24 hours. And then you can then use this model for prediction. And of course, you saw here already an example of a model where we create the training set and the test set. And this is now an idea how good or how nicely our model fits our data. But this is not the purpose of our um, machine learning model for time series prediction. We want to know what happens in the future. And this is where we need then the deployment. So let's have a quick look at the deployment in Nyman's platform and for time series specifically at the end of this webinar. So once we have trained the model, we save the model. So we have some training data, then we have the time series model, in this case a machine learning model, and we save it for further deployment where we have then some seed data and we access in this deployment workflow the pre-trained model. Here we have done the analysis work and we have adjusted the parameters so that our predictions and future forecasts are as, as accurate as possible. Here we then use 
the model to generate values in the future. The problem is though that we have this seed data, for example, for the last uh, 10 days to predict the sales of tomorrow. But if we are interested in the sales in the next month, so we would need to forecast 30 values in the future. So our forecast horizon would be 30. Our model is not working anymore, but if we do some dynamic deployment, we can also generate predictions for 30 values ahead. And how does this work? You know, we need the 10 past values and we only have them available to forecast the value next, so on next day. If you wanted to forecast the value next week, there would be a gap of seven past values. And to fill this gap, we can use as past values the predictions for these past values from the point of view of this particular value in the future. And we can do this with a recursive loop, which means that we generate one forecast at a time. So we start with the seed data, 10 past values. We generate the forecast for tomorrow, so the next forecast. Then we use this forecasted value and now the nine past values together to generate the forecasts two days ahead. Now we have two forecasted past values and still eight values that are actual past, value, past values and we forecast the value three days ahead and so on until we have a forecast for all the values within our forecast horizon, like for example, 30 days, so 30 iterations. And this I can show you quickly in a demo how this works. So here you see first where we train the machine learning model. Like before, we decompose the signal so that we can extract the regularities from our time series. The weight trend in this energy consumption data and also the main seasonalities, the daily seasonality and weekly seasonality. Now we have already something regular and we don't need to model this anymore by a machine learning model. We have already extracted it by using the time series analytics methods. What we need to model is this irregular part, which is a residual. And that is then the target column in our time series model, in the regression model. And here we have selected the random forest regression. The predictor columns are generated here by the lag column node. And we are interested in the values of energy consumption 10 hours uh, before. And now we have one or the predicted values here for this test data. And we also have an estimate of our time series model, how good it is performing. And it's pretty good. So to model this residual, our random forest regression model is quite uh, good. This is why we now use this model to generate predictions in the future, so for the dynamic deployment. And for that one, I have also here something to show you. So let's first take a look at these three nodes. And here we have the seed data to generate the first forecast. And then we have the trained model, so in this case, the random forest regression model. And we go inside the loop deployment component. And you find here, a regression loop, uh, sorry, a recursive loop, which does now the dynamic forecasting for the forecast horizon, which we have defined here. So 168, which means we are interested in the energy consumption in the next week, containing altogether 168 hours. What happens here inside the recursive loop? So we always access the model. The model doesn't change, but what changes? We have here some data, the residual, the value that we are going to predict, that is the unknown value in the future, and then the 10 lagged values. And we apply it, or oh, this is now the data to predict by the predictor node, and we get a predicted residual value. And here it is, and this is now the value that we add to the past values passed to generate the next forecast. And what happens here? We remove the oldest values. So if this not, was now the first iteration, we would start with the 10 past values that we now actually use them to generate the forecast here, remove 
the tenth value, so the oldest value. And now we have the nine here, the nine values that we actually know, plus the one for a classic value to generate by the next iteration, the one value ahead. Once we have done that, we have by this loop deployment now, the forecast is residual values. But this is not the goal of our uh, forecast. We want to know the energy consumption values, so not the irregular parts of it. And that's why we restore the seasonality and trend now to these forecasted values using the information that we uh, already obtained in the training phase. So what we have saved here, we have saved the trend model as a linear regression model. And then we have extracted the lags where the two major seasonalities occur. So the lag for weekly seasonality and lag for daily seasonality. And here, what we do, we undo the difference. So we sum the forecasted residual values now at the lags, first at the lag of second seasonality, 168. And this series, we then sum at the lag of the first seasonality, 24. And at the end, we then use this trend model to have the final predictions of the energy consumption. For the purpose of this demo, we have actually the actual values to assess how good our forecasts are. And we can visualize them, for example, in a line plot and see visually, see how good our forecast is. And we can also assess the forecast accuracy using these error metrics and accuracy statistics, and we see our forecast is doing quite good. So here you see, despite that there are lots of regularities, but also irregularities in our time series, we see that our model, our forecast consisting of the forecasts by the machine learning model, by the extracted seasonality components and the trend component, we get quite accurate forecasts.